I'm Sid Mitchell and these are my stories. <laughs> Hi folks, I'm having a good day today. Let me the first welcome you to Autism Rocks and Rolls. Now before we begin, I must note that I'm not a doctor or psychiatrist. If you're starting to be diagnosed with autism, please see a physician. I only speak based on my experiences. I also on the right to the intro natural. They are found on YouTube.com. I also have missions they like to reveal with all of you. The mission of Autism Rocks and Rolls is to take the negative stigma off of autism and other conditions that may think are disabilities. People on the spectrum are not broken and not need to be fixed. Those who have conditions or abilities are not to be pitied. There's nothing to be sorry about. I also have some pay for the following. Through Stone Belt, individuals with different abilities can support and resources. This organization has been operating in South Central Indiana since 1958, making it the oldest and largest in the industry. Services offered by Stone Belt benefit more than just customers. Changes have resulted from their efforts. Indiana's Piece by Piece ABA Center is excellent. Piece by Piece is a family-run business that values each child and family to empower parents and help young children reach their potential. We utilize evidence-based practices. There are several cities served by the company, including Fort Wayne, Lebanon, Lafayette, Crawfordsville, Cloverdale, and Frankfurt. Check out their website or contact your local branch for more information. This is an exciting experience that you won't want to miss. A discussion about farm CBD oil in Bedford, Kentucky is urgent. To produce superior CBD oil, they combine agricultural, pharmacy, chemistry, quality, and the engineering. Their mission is to surpass industry expectations in the hemp production. Quality is the key at farm CBD. As well, Guthrie's Creek Butchery deserves attention. Guthrie Creek is a small family-owned and operated butcher shop located in Bedford, Indiana that maintains obsolete and perishing butcheries so you can feel secure when you are purchased something from us. The Safeguard Company is located in Bloomington, Indiana. Their location on Kirkwood Avenue can accommodate temporary business and security needs. Safeguards is where to look for regulations if you are looking to enter the business world. I also have to talk about the Yoho General Store. Owned by Marcy Cook, this store is a Greene County attraction. It's a general store, but is also known for their restaurant and its southern-based cooking and delicious ice cream. Feel free to visit this wonderful place. I want to go to Bedford and talk about Salt Creek Brewery. It is a brewery that serves craft beer with live music. However, what makes this place so unique is that everything is done in a workshop. You will want to visit this place because you will never forget you were there. Next on my list is Buffalo Wings and Rings in Bedford, Indiana. These are the best wings and rings in the world because you will never leave upset there. The atmosphere and staff are so friendly, you will exit their place with a smile. Finally, be sure to drop in or on Kona in near Bloomington, Indiana. Bloomington's Kona is great because it never disappoints. Given every way they serve great shaped ice, the sequence does not disappoint. They are gradually offering fall flavors such as apple and pumpkin pie. When you do find them, do some highs by grabbing an ice cold treat or a wave. And there are some people I like to thank. So since the last episode, I have done three events. First, I spoke at the Indiana Virtual Heart to Heart Conference that was produced by my friends, Indiana Family to Family, where I shared my story and what I've done to overcome the odds. Next, I spoke at Shoal Schools and talked about bullying. Everyone was hearing me out. They were a great audience and truly saw what it was like to go through what I had to go through. Finally, I commentated again at the DCW show in Portland, Indiana with my friends, Chris and Tony Gonzalez. I saw my pal Mick Foley in C-145 getting hardcore with Mick Foley. I even met the boogeyman. All three were amazing times, and I will never forget them for as long as I live. Now, folks, we'll be right back here and ad from the bar of Maryland Ridge. So let's get to it. There is a hidden gem in eastern Greene County, folks. Fowler's Pumpkin Patch and the barn on Maryland Ridge Wedding Barn. Autism Rocks and Rolls is very proud to tell you about our friends, Perry and Renee Fowler, and their place of business. Both Fowler Pumpkin Patch and the barn on Maryland Ridge is a relaxing drive approximately 15 minutes from the heart of Bloomington, Indiana, and an hour south of Indianapolis. You can find them at 5347 South Greene County Line Road, Bloomington, Indiana, 47403. The property has numerous picture locations including several rolling fields, antique tractors, red and rustic barns, trees, and much more. Customized wedding packages are offered on their website. The surrounding area also provides several hotels in which to have your guests stay for your destination wedding. Also, Fowler's Pumpkin Patch is a family-owned and operated seasonal pumpkin patch. It's the perfect place to take your family for some fall fun. Enjoy picking out pumpkins, hay rides, a corn maze, and a petting zoo. Call the Fowlers today at 812-327-4895 or 812 Two five sixty twenty two. All right, folks, you're back. And yes, you'll definitely hear the words I do if you check out this wedding barn. Now, <laughs> today we have someone really special. Today I have Tamika Lampson, or as she is called, T-Lamb, 
who is a wondrous actress and creator. Tamika is a postgraduate of the American College of Howard University, and she is an AFI alumna of the prestigious Women's Directing Workshop. After serving as researcher advisor at the Academy of Motion Pictures, Arts, and Sciences, she became the executive director of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Program, Commercial Director's Diversity Program, CDDP. I wanted her on the show because in 2006, she founded her nonprofit, Make a Film Foundation, or abbreviate MAFF. MAFF fulfills children's film aspirations by helping children with serious and life threatening illnesses connect with renowned authors, directors, and producers while creating a short film legacy. It is more than that because she is also a senior vice president of development and production at Film Co. And she has a dual line of art funding and commerce. So please help me welcome the accomplished and sweet Tamika Lanson to the show. How are we doing, Tamika? Oh, thank you. I love that introduction, Sam. And my favorite part was that you said I was sweet. <laughs> of course, you thank seem you. like it based on my talk to you. It's very happy to be here. And I'm trying to get to that petting zoo in Indiana. Hey, we may awesome. get there. You never know. We'll figure out a way to get you there. <laughs> thank you. So my first question is this. What does running an organization that cares to children with life-threatening sicknesses mean to you? Oh, wow. That's such a huge question, Sam. Thank you so much for asking it. So running this organization and meeting these amazing and unique children who deal with such extreme circumstances and traumas and illnesses is super inspirational in so many ways. I get to see these kids be so courageous and also create these visions that will last forever. And the impact is huge. It's not just an impact on me, but they impact the people who work with them on the film. They're impacted. And all of the children and other people who see their films are also impacted. I always say it's a little bit bittersweet, right? Because for the kids who create the films but don't survive or pass away shortly thereafter, I feel like they are always there for us to see them on the screen, which is the whole purpose of this organization. There's a legacy that's left. Their spirit is still there. To me, it's like they never go away, right? Because I can always have them. It's like their legacy lives on. You said it perfectly. What were your initial thoughts when you decided you were going to have an organization that involved children with life-threatening medical conditions. Initially, how this really came about was a friend asked me if I could do anything, what would it be? And I said, aside from filmmaking, I would grant wishes to kids in the Make-A-Wish Foundation. I have always been inspired by that organization and what they do for kids. So I was like, well, maybe I can combine these two passions and actually create an organization where I'm able to make films and supply this incredible process of filmmaking to this unique sort of population of kids and children. I feel like I get more from it. I think that's always the secret in service, right? You actually yourself get a lot from it. It seems like you're giving, right? And you are, but you're getting so much from it as well. It's a trade-off in a sense. You're getting, but you're also giving. That way, everyone's happy. Yes, a beautiful trade-off, a beautiful win-win, right? It is a beautiful win-win. I would agree. And I looked at your work, and I was very impressed what you do with those students. I mean, it's like you are like their buddy before they may not make it. I try and be as supportive as possible, but whatever it is that they need me to be for that time. Sometimes it's very hard because the children are sometimes aware of exactly what's happening to their body, exactly what's happening to them mentally and emotionally as they're going through whatever they're going through. So they can be very vocal about their fears, I'll put it that way. And so that can be a little bit painful to hear someone say, I don't want to die or that kind of thing. But we have a lot of people who surround the kids and surround the children and really make them understand that what they're creating is going to be here forever. So they're going to another space, but they're always going to be here with us. That's really the message that we try and communicate. Right. And here's the deal. If you get a limited amount of time and space, it kind of is a pain for obvious reasons, but it's also kind of a gift because it makes you think, okay, what can I do before I do go six feet under and live out my legacy? 
Yeah. And you know what, Sam, that's a message for all of us because we're all going to go to that other plane, right? We're all going to go to another spiritual level. We're all going to pass on and we never know when that's going to happen. So it's a lesson for us as well to really live in the moment. Even for myself, what is it that my legacy, I want my legacy to be? What is it that I want to share? And that's really what these children are able to communicate in a really beautiful and visceral way. Now, based on your observations, how do you think someone with a life-threatening condition or a disease brain operates? Ooh, so I feel like people who are living with a life-threatening illness have a very specific gift of being able to live in the moment. I think that living in the moment is something that a lot of us strive to do, but we worry a lot if we think about all these other things. But if you know that you're living with something that could kill you at any moment kind of thing, right? Or it's painful, or then I think your brain sort of highlights gratitude in a certain way. And so you're embracing and living in the moment in a really special kind of way. I would agree with that because you have so much limited amount. You're looking at the simplest things. You're looking at the sunset. You probably didn't do that before you had this life-threatening condition. And granted, I do that a lot of times, geeky like that in a sense. But I'm yeah. just trying to state that you appreciate the smaller things. I love the way you said that. Yeah, you appreciate the smaller things, the little things in life. Maybe you understand that sometimes the little things are big things, right? Oh, I would agree with that 100%. I mean, this podcast, while it is little, it's big because I'll be honest, this is from a basement right now. <laughs> you would never know it with your beautiful blue background. Thank you. <laughs> now, out of curiosity, what is the most rewarding and the most difficult part about having a nonprofit that involves children with life-threatening conditions? The most rewarding part about having a nonprofit that involves children who have life-threatening conditions is that I really get to experience a different level of understanding when it comes to their gift to the world and their voice. Once these kids understand that we are just a space for them to share their voice, they sort of open up and share a part of them that I'm not sure anyone has ever really gotten a chance to experience because a lot of times they're seen through the lens of their disease. But when we come into the picture, we're like, no, we want you to be able to share whatever you want to share. The parts of you that no one really gets to see or understand, it's your voice. So we get to see these kids really open up and blossom and share their voice in a whole new way. And it's so inspiring. Their courage is inspiring. Now, the most difficult part I would say is just seeing their struggle, seeing their pain, seeing their family's pain, maybe understanding that they're not going to physically be here forever, but knowing that we'll at least have their spirit and their voice here with whatever they create. Honestly, I wish I would have found you guys a long time ago because, and I'm not saying have a life-threatening condition or a disease, but with autism, when it comes to that, we get excluded a lot and deal with all the negative stereotyping, which is very fun. <laughs> you can imagine that. But for 15 years, I did not really have a voice. No one heard me out. No one thought, well, this guy is kind of cool, actually. Let's hang out with him. I didn't get that feeling. And I wish yeah. I would have found you guys sooner so I could have an outlet for a voice. I would have loved to have met you. I don't know. Are you allowed to say how old you are, Sam, right now? Yes, I can say how old I am. I'm 20. So yeah, I would have loved to have met you as well because we actually have worked with kids who have autism. And they've created films, little documentary short films. I would have loved to have seen what you would have created, but you didn't even need us, Sam. You created, your voice is being shared through this podcast. So right. you didn't really need why. the film side. Not enough <laughs> is the shortest answer I can give you is I started this because I had enough. I just mm. had enough of dealing with the exclusion, dealing with getting poked with sticks, as I call it. I was just done. So I thought, you know what? You're going to hear me out. One way or another, I'm going to get heard. And if it's through a microphone and through a soundboard, so be it. It may not be when I go into Walmart, but it may be turn her around the world in a basement. This is an amazing platform. And I am so glad that you not only get to share your voice, but through you, a lot of people are having a whole entire different understanding of autism. They're also getting to hear your experience, both positive and negative with autism and just your whole entire viewpoint about it, which is 
what we need. So I love this platform and I'm so proud of you. And I'm so honored that you have me on your show. Thank you so much. Of, of course, buddy. Now, I obviously, I know you have experience like someone with a life training condition, but you never had one yourself. So I'm going to put you on the spot here, kind of. So uh -huh. what advice would you give to someone with a life-threatening condition? Wow, that's interesting because I'm the one who gets all the inspiration and advice. It really, I wouldn't just phrase it as advice, but I would say I am inspired by kids who I have dealt with who have life-threatening illnesses because of their courage and their ability to just be positive. Like one of the young ladies that I helped to create her film, her mantra was love life, be positive, be, dream big. And I think we could all sort of use that advice. And I hear that every day. And I think of her all the time when I see anything that says dream big or be positive, love life. It reminds me that that's sort of the world that I want to live in and the space that I want to live in moment by moment. Dreaming big, being positive, loving life exactly where it is. Yeah. Well, let me ask this then too. How could someone shift their mind in a sense to where they can get from the, oh my God, I have this life-threatening condition. I'm going to die soon to, okay, mm -hmm. I had this limited amount of time. Let's go enjoy it before the time does come. I feel like everyone has to get there on their own, right? Like we all have our own path and none of us are the same. So how we get there and when we get there is personal. But I think that there's so many examples of people who have lived with uh, life-threatening diseases or have terminal illnesses who are huge and beautiful examples of how to live their life with grace, even though they're dealing with this kind of disease or trauma, or I'll even say expiration date that the doctors have put on their time here. So there's so many examples. And I think every single one of those examples helps us to remember whether we have a life-threatening disease that has been designated or whether we're just like, we all just know we could die tomorrow. Nothing is promised, right? So if you live like that every day, it may not be like you have cancer or you have this, but we do know that we're all going to die. We just don't know when or how. In a sense, we're all kind of in the same boat. It's just a matter of how much pain we're dealing with. Some people know exactly or have some idea of when it's going to happen and some don't, but we all know it's going to happen. I'll be honest with you. I mean, I kind of accepted that too, because part of the other reason why I started this podcast was I wanted to build something and create a legacy. And I think yeah. I've built it well. So, and I thought of the death myself, like if I get yeah. this, yada, yada, yada. That's because when I get bored, I think a lot. And I would probably <laughs> say that if I put the pin in tomorrow, like if that had to happen, mm -hmm. I'd be okay yeah. with that. So I'm not saying like I've accepted death, but I've accepted it to the point where, you know what? I get this life-threatening condition that may kill me tomorrow. So be it. I've done enough, I think. That's a great way to look at things, Sam. I feel like that means, and I'm putting this meaning on what you just said, so I don't know if that's really what it is, but I feel like that means that you're in a great place in your life and that you have been living a wonderful life and living your life in such a way that you're ready. Like I feel like if we can each day do something positive, do some good, and really every single day be like, well, am I ready to go? Have I told everyone that I love them? Have I shared everything that I need to share in this day, in this moment, to the best of my ability? Then you're ready. You don't get to choose anyway. <laughs> so be a good person and live a good life and tell people what you need to tell them so that no matter when it happens, you'll be ready, right? That's kind of how I see it. Yeah, and, and as I say, it took 16 years to get there, but I always believe in the phrase, better late than never. Yes. <laughs> I embrace that wholeheartedly because I'm a late bloomer in a lot of things, Sam. <laughs> so I really believe that. <laughs> now, I do want to talk to you more about this amazing, and I mean amazing, nonprofit Make a Film Foundation. So you said you kind of got your inspiration from Make a Wish. So you said that's what inspired you, really. But can you tell us about that friend that's inspired you to start Make a Film Foundation. What was the story like on that? So I'll tell you a little bit of my Hollywood story, right? So I wrote a script and I sold it for six figures, like over a hundred thousand dollars. But here's the Hollywood part. The check was bad, Sam. It was a bad check. So I never 
got to cash that check. And it made me so depressed that I was like, well, I don't ever want to feel this way again. I want to share my gifts and my talents, not put a price on it, like a physical price that's going to hurt me if it doesn't happen. I started to volunteer my time, like share experience as a writer and a director at these various nonprofits, teach theater and screenwriting and film to kids. And I really fell in love with doing it. So that's when my friend was like, okay, well, I see you doing all of this service oriented work with your filmmaking. That's when they asked me if I could do anything, what would I do? And I said, well, I should be doing that, right? I love filmmaking and I love being in service, especially with kids and children and youth. So if I can do both of those things, then I'll really be filling my purpose and doing what I feel like I was put on this earth to do. So that's kind of how that came about. That's awesome. And you said you teach. So I got to ask, my mom's a teacher and I'm always curious. What would you say is like your teaching style? Like, is you a visual person with the children? Are you a like auditory person with the children? How do you teach them about this film? Mm, I'm both. And I'm also practical because I personally am a practical learner. You can show me things, but I also have to physically have my hands on it and do it myself in order for it to stick in my brain. I really understand that there's no one way to teach people. Like we all learn differently. Like you might learn differently than me. Some people need to hear it. Some people need to see it like what you're saying. Some people need to actually do it themselves. I try and teach not in a universal way. Sure, I have my overall teaching style, but then individually understand what each child might need and then sort of give them what they need in that way. Gotcha. What do you do to understand them? Oh, I talk to them. And I. so if you actually pay attention to people, then you can kind of see what works for them. And you can also talk to them. Like just with you, I can talk to you and say, okay, Sam, so when you're trying to learn how to set up a computer, is it better for someone to talk to you about it and you hear it in your brain and then you know how to do it? Is it better for you to visually see it? Or do you need to do a little bit of both? Do you need me to talk you through it as you're physically doing it? So if I have those conversations, see, I see you nodding, then right away, you've just told me what it is that you need and how you learn, right? Exactly. And I'll tell you straight up how it is. I mean, I've always been that type of person where I'm like, okay, here's the deal. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do this, but we can try our best. You'll we'll probably have to do it this way. You can't do it that way. I apologize, but you have to find someone else again. <laughs> See, that's great. That's very self-aware. It takes a minute to sort of learn your way of, and I guess depending on how old the kids are, you have to sort of trial and error because you don't always know how you learn, right? Until you do. Now, I do want to know about some stories. So I guess in a sense, it's going to be story time with Tamika in here in a minute. So can okay. you share one or two stories of individuals who lives have been changed because of your organization? Ooh, wow. You really went there. Okay. So, <laughs> well, let me just start with myself, right? <laughs> My life has definitely been changed and transformed being the source and being a part of this organization, being able to make other people's dreams come true and have them being a source of them, being able to share their voice through this organization has really impacted me and ways I will never be able to fully explain. I'm super, super grateful. But specifically to kids, I'll just go with one of the kids who, uh, his name is Anthony Conti, and he came to us with stage four cancer. And he was always into film and he really wanted to do a horror film because that's what he liked. Honestly, we felt like we weren't going to be able to do it because his disease was really accelerated. And we really didn't know how much time we had. Like they were saying anywhere from two weeks to two months. And we didn't know if that would be enough time, but we took it on anyway, because he was just so amazing and had such a vision. Anthony did this incredible film that had uh, like Johnny Depp and J.K. Simmons and Laura Dern and all these amazing people. Sam Raimi was one of his directors, Catherine Hardwick, who did Twilight. And he had just the most beautiful unfolding of his journey. And he got to do a lot of different things. So he liked to not just make the film, but he also got to compose music with Trent Reznor and Attic Atticus Ross, Nine Inch Nails, I think. And he got to, um, so he got many different sort of wishes fulfilled within the context of this one creation of a film. I'll tell you, this is the moment that I would say when he was in a coma, 
and his film had been done. He got to see it premiered in his hospital with his family and friends and some of his doctors. He had fallen into a coma. It was the last week of his life. His mom, uh, no, his dad said that he, or, or maybe it was the grandmother. I can't remember which one of his family members. I think it was his grandmother. She said that he woke up out of his coma. He called one of our producers and had a full on conversation about the film and the impact of the film and what he wanted to do. He fell back into a coma. And that was the last time that he was communicating with anyone. Shortly after that, he passed away. But the one time he woke up out of his coma, he woke up to talk about the experience of the film and how much it meant to him. That really means a lot to us because we feel like even during his transition, this legacy that he created, this experience that he had, had a major impact on him. First of all, before I say anything, that's great you created it, but that movie better stay the heck away from me. Eight horror stuff, not doing horror movies, not doing it. No, 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 no. <laughs> I don't play that game. It was a zombie movie. <laughs> oh, still not doing it. That's even scarier. I'm going to be scaring people next weekend. But in all yeah. seriousness, I'm so thankful that he got that because the fact that his last call was to you has to say something. It says a lot that his last call, it was actually to my a producer, Adele, and she was one of our main producers on, on this uh, particular film as well, and, and our casting director. She had formed a really close relationship as well as I did. It was really impactful to have him reach out to us in that way. Now, I do want to know this. You have stayed for you, the executive director. So what would you say some of your duties are as the executive director for the Make a Film Foundation? As the exec director and founder, a lot of things fall on my shoulders. So I sort of help to choose the participants. I help to partner with other organizations who want to create films with us, I help to raise the funds and the finances. I help to cast and set up the crew and set up the board of directors. So there's a lot of administrative stuff, as well as I will say corporate creative stuff and creative stuff. So really, I kind of do a little bit of everything and I have done everything. On this I, film. I think you do, but you have help, right? With other people. Oh yeah. So I definitely have help. I mean, typically on a day-to-day -day basis, it's mostly me, but I have a board that we have helped to make some of the main decisions. And then when we actually do projects, we have tons of people. Because when we do the projects, we get so many people in the industry to volunteer. We get people who donate things. We get directors, writers who help to mentor and actors to participate and all of the makeup and the gaffers and the other producers and the line producers, all of the people that you see. You know, when you watch a movie and you see all of those credits, all of those people are the people who help us as well as a few additional people because it's a nonprofit. So we typically, when we're doing a project, it's at least a hundred plus people who are working with us. Wow. In a sense, they're the movie stars. You mean you really do make them the full experience of being on set, the as whole, they say. Exactly. It's the whole entire experience from pre-production, their vision to pre-production, writing the script to principal photography, which is the production to post-production where they do all the music and the editing. And Anthony even sketched out the poster for his film. So he sketched out the poster and then we got some people to come in and create it in a more expansive way because he wanted to look like a comic book. So he participated in every aspect of his film, which was amazing. I bet it was. And I'm, you know, I'm so thankful that that kid came into your life. I, I really am. Except you're missing one thing though. I just realized you're missing one thing. What about the red oh, carpet? We, oh, we do the red carpet. Absolutely. We actually do red carpet premieres in LA because everyone wants to do it in Hollywood. And then we make sure to do a red carpet premiere in the hometown of the kids. So Anthony was from Boston. So we did a red carpet premiere in Boston. We actually did a couple. We did one at his hospital. We did one at his school. And then we also, for Play Be About, who was one of our amazing participants, we did one in Kansas, which was where he was from. And we also did one in Hollywood, right? So everyone gets a premiere in Hollywood, one of the big, huge ones in Hollywood, as well as their hometown, because most of the kids are not from California. They're from somewhere else. Hey, here's the deal. This is my belief. If a little person in Indiana can do that, then I would surely 100% believe someone in Kansas can do a red carpet. Absolutely. 
So the red carpets are great. Friends, family, people in town. And usually when we do the red carpets, we get like a theater. One of the big theaters in town will donate the theater. So they put the marquee up. So it's actually a big, huge deal. Sometimes we even get the limos, you know, a limo service to pick up the kids and bring them <laughs> to the red carpet. So it's the whole thing, the whole experience in their hometown. Now, I do want to know this. So I, you started filming before the Make a Film Foundation. So what got you interested in the filming? Was it the characters? Was it the concept of a movie? What was it in the film that you was like, oh my gosh, this is really cool? Wow, that's such a good question question. So let me just say this. I was always into theater and things like that. As a kid, I like to see theater and see things come to life in a real sort of way, even though it was fake because it was theater, but it seemed real to me. For instance, when I saw West Side Story for the first time, I was a kid and I actually thought that people had really died in, in that theater play. And so when they came out to bow afterwards, I was like, <gasps> Oh my God, they're, they're alive. <laughs> and everyone thought it was so funny because I thought that they had died and they're coming out to take a bow. So I was always sort of interested in that world. And then I think specifically for film, it was just how big it was and to be able to be drawn into a whole different world, my imagination to expand. Because when I was a kid, the first movies I saw were sort of like the Disney movies where there was a lot of magic and fantasy and things like that. And so I think it really just opened up my imagination in a way that had never been opened before. And then it just continued from there. Just my love of stories and being able to tell stories was what really attracted me to it. And it sounds like you love them whether they're fiction or not. Yes, I do. <laughs> yeah, I can tell that. <laughs> you also are an actor. So I had to ask, in your acting eyes, what makes a great actor? Wow. You know, it's interesting because what makes a great actor to me is also kind of connected to some of the other things that we've been talking about, like living in the moment. I feel like what makes a great actor is their ability to be in the moment of whatever they're doing. So they're not thinking about how they're going to do it, right? They're literally able to channel into their soul and their spirit and express from that space in the moment, some authentic point of view or have some authentic expression from being in the moment right then. So it's truth, being able to share a momentary truth. Okay, but what about this too? You have to think the moment's real in a sense. I know they're yeah, acting yeah. behind screens. I mean, I get that, but you have to think the moment's real. So for example, I had a previous guest who was an actress in a TV series called Resident Alien and Sneaky Pete. Her name was Sarah Tomko, and for the listeners and for you, if you haven't checked out the podcast, see uh, 141, meet Asta Suzanne, and parentheses, Sarah Tomko, for more information. Her best trait, I'm not kidding you, I think, and this is what I've seen through experience, she lives in the moment. Because yeah. I think when it comes to that series, she thinks it's real. She thinks like, oh my God, the alien died. Ah. That's exactly right. That's what I mean. You know, living in the moment, being in the moment, you as an actor have to believe that it's real. What's happening is real. You have to, it's like jumping into the body of, you know, like, I guess if you were a ghost, you jump in the body, it's real for you now, right? So it's, it's like a real thing that's unfolding. Like, so when an actor is crying, for instance, right? Whatever is happening inside of them is authentic. It's real. So they have to actually believe that they're experiencing whatever is happening that then leads to grief or sadness or whatever it is that would make them want to cry. I could do that if the thing was real because I think of it if it was an Alvin and a chipmunk style almost and you had right. to stare at something dying. I'd be like, okay, really? I'm supposed to cry over the fact that I'm looking at a tennis ball right now that's supposedly <laughs> dead. I, I need to look at the chipmunk. You need to see the real thing. <laughs> so you have to put yourself in the place of visualizing. You're not looking at a tennis ball. You're actually in your mind's eye looking at the thing that's actually dead or that you've lost. Yeah, but I, I feel really embarrassed about that. I'd be like, okay, I'm looking at a tennis ball. Seriously, this is what actors do. This is interesting right now. 
Did acting come natural to you or did you have to have help? So I think that I was naturally attracted to acting. So there was some raw talent there, but I did go to school for acting. I went to American University and Howard University where I studied theater and I took a lot of classes when I was in New York. So I think that it's always good as with anything, right? If you continue to study and sort of fine tune your talent. It's sort of like, if you think about it this way, your very first podcast is very different than your podcast now, because your first one, you were like, okay, well, I have some talent. I kind of know what I'm doing, but now you're so much more seasoned because you've done so many, right? It's almost like, you know what you're doing, right? <laughs> yeah, I think I know what I'm doing at least. I mean, if I got you know, 11K doing, downloads, yeah. that says something, but. Yeah, Sam, that's what I'm saying. Podcast number one, to the one today and everything in between, every time you do one, you learn something, right? Every time somebody does a role, they get better and they learn something. So it's a lifelong process. Let me ask you this. Now you said the word role that kind of hit me with the question. How could someone get into a role? So for example, if let's say this quiet, introverted kid is very shy, he's asked to play, not be, but play an outgoing motorcycle person, for example. That's thing I could think right. of, I know. But how could he get into that? That's a very interesting question because quiet as it's kept, a lot of actors are kind of shy. And what they love about being an actor is that they can actually be the types of people that they would never typically be able to be in life, right? So if I'm a shy person, but I love acting, what might appeal to me is that I can actually research and study a very outgoing person and then become that person in the role. And then I can still be the shy little me or whatever in real life, but I get to actually experience this amazing personality that I don't necessarily feel comfortable being in real life, but I feel comfortable doing it in the form of a role. It was kind of an issue, it was kind of a pro. As you may know through podcasts or not, I'm actually a humongous fan of pro wrestling. And part of the reason why I like it is the acting. Those faces yeah. and those heels, they all have different traits. But the one thing I have in common is the confidence. They're not afraid to go, yeah. boom, and I wish I could do that in real life. I bet they could wish they could do that in real life. So it definitely yeah. gives them a role to make them yeah. feel confident. Who are some of your acting influences and why? Ooh, that's so good. I love Meryl Streep, Viola Davis. They are two big ones because I feel like when it comes to being in the moment, well, I'll say Viola Davis, when it comes to being in the moment and really making you feel like she has embodied the characters, I feel like almost, I don't know who, who does it better. She's incredible. And Meryl Streep does that. And she also is able to do incredible characters right like accents and things like that like she can transform herself in ways that are pretty incredible and then there's a lot of incredible male actors that I like as well like I love Daniel Day-Lewis he's always been one of my favorites and then there's a lot of young actors coming up um but obviously you know now my brain is not <laughs> like I I see all the faces and no names right now but there's so many incredible actors out there right now that are doing just wonderful work. I would say there's an actress, I'm not going to get her name right, but she's in The Woman King, a young actress. She's fantastic. Oh, and I don't know if you saw the Western that was on Netflix called Heart of They Fall, but there's a young actress in there who's also playing Mamie Till in the uh, Emmett Till story. And she's incredible. I mean, just fantastic. There's a lot of really great actors right now. Right. What about The Rock, though? You gotta give him props. I'm definitely not gonna not give The Rock props. <laughs> you know, he's a big dude. He might come after me if I don't give him the right props. Hey, yeah, with The Rock bottom. <laughs> Oh my God, that's funny. Yes, I love The Rock and I love the movies that he does. He's very, he's a lot of fun. Why not contact him? Have you ever thought about like contacting him? Because I don't know why. It's just me. My, my gut sometimes tricks me, but I, my gut's saying he might do it. Like he might would be willing to do that for someone. Because I've heard he's a very humble person. I definitely will put him on the list. 
I think you're right. I think that he would definitely do it. And I will just say this. Typically, what we do is once we have um, the kid and it's their vision that we sort of focus on. So we ask what their favorite actors are and who their favorite actors are. And we try and get those actors in their films. And we have to sort of base it on whatever their script is. So we have to make sure there's a role that makes sense for The Rock to be in, right? Yeah, <laughs> I'll, I'll know, I know someone else who would do it. Any one of my guests that I've had previously, I know would probably do it. And Mick Foley. Oh. Mick Foley, oh, okay. the hardcore wrestler, I know yeah, he yeah. would do it. He is the oh, humblest okay. person you'll ever meet. I'm telling you for a fact, if you told him the situation, if I had to bet money, he'd do it. All right. Well, I'm going to have to access you as my casting director next time. So. Yeah, <laughs> of course. You can do that. I know I have some guests who have thought about being actresses. One of my previous guests, Maya Zakay. And see 214 remaining victorious with Maya Zakay. She stayed before mm-hmm. that. She wants to become a future actress. She's in training right now. Right. So just, I'm, I'm just helping you out here a little bit. You sure are. Thank uh, you. Not a problem, buddy. So now I'm curious about you, though. Is there any movies okay. you're hoping to act in for the future? Well, if I could have my, my big dream, I would love to be in one of the Marvel Black Panther movies, <laughs> like Wakanda Forever or one of those type movies. Oh my goodness, I would love to be. But I would also really love to be in any Marvel movie, right? <laughs> You need to talk to my mom right now. I'm not kidding. She, when you get off, you got to talk to her. She loves the Black Panther. Favorite superhero really? of all time. Okay. Well, she and I, we are simpatico. Yep. <laughs> I'm sorry, though. I'm the I'm the Hulk guy. I'm the green Hulk, okay. Hulk okay. smash dude. You know uh, Mark Ruffalo then, right? Probably. Yeah, 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 yeah. So once when I was in New York with my brother, we saw him in the park because my nephew and my brother's son, we were like in the park and we saw him across the way. And I said, oh my God, that's Mark Ruffalo. He plays the Hulk. And my brother totally fanboyed on him. And I was like, do not go over there and disturb that man who's out with his daughter playing in the park. Do not. <laughs> And yet here he goes. Hey, what you doing? <laughs> it was so funny. <laughs> now, folks, we'll be right back. We're going to hear about Bobcat Ellisville, Indiana. So let's get to it. Are you wanting to do construction in your life? If so, Bobcat at Ellisville, Indiana is the place for you to work. For 60 years, Bob Curl and the other six locations have been offered as a resource to construction equipment and sales. They can provide you with Bobcat equipment, Bronkite trailers, Bill Power Tools, Echo Outdoor Power Equipment, Renmax Power Equipment, and Xmark Commercial Mowers. They also carry the products that are called Xaviators, Compact Track Loaders, Skid Steer Loaders, Versa Handler, Telescope Tool Carriers, All Wheel Steer Loaders, Utility Vehicles, and Toolcat Utility Work Machines, plus a wide section of attachments. Be sure to use their services and give them a call at 800 825 9132. All right, folks, we're back. And yes, if you check them out, you might like some Bobcats. You never know. Now, speaking of the sponsors, I looked at your list of sponsors and holy crap. I couldn't believe some of the companies. Coca-Cola. I think Starbucks was one of them, if I remember correctly. So my question is, how would you get that big list of sponsors for the Make a Film Foundation? We have always had a really good time out here with getting sponsors. Everyone has been very gracious and generous. I don't know if anyone ever says no. I mean, it's such a great cause and it feels like people really want to contribute it in whatever ways they can contribute that typically we don't really get no's. Everyone says, yes, they want to help. It's just a matter of how much they can help and if the timing is right for them to help. But typically we just ask and people say yes. That's what I do too. I actually do the same thing. I actually got some sponsors myself, and I what I did was I went around like my little area and hit Bloomington, in Indiana, and a lot of other places around there. There were some no's you can imagine, but there were several yeses out there that it piqued their interest. So I agree. I think getting out there and asking is the only way to do it if you want sponsors bad enough. Absolutely. And I think in general, people are good, right? People want to help and support. You're doing something amazing. And I don't know who wouldn't want to support you, (laughs) right? I would have said yes. I mean, I did, right? (laughs) Now you're also a screenwriter. 
So out of the screens you wrote, in, and that might include your first one, which we're going to talk about later, but I want to know, what was your favorite script to write and why? Honestly, my favorite script was my very first script called Jar by the Door because, well, one, it was my first script, so I was so proud that I was able to do it because writing is so hard. Writing can be so difficult. And just accomplishing the first one was a thing, right? And then it was also inspired by something not so great that happened, but it was catharsis for me to be able to just write this script about it. The short of it is my book bag was stolen. And it was years ago, had a bunch of irreplaceable items in it. And I used that as a catalyst to write my first screenplay. Where did you get your ideas from the first script, The Jar from the Door? The Jar by the Door. Yes. So the title itself is inspired by Eleanor Rigby, which is a Beatles song. So it's part of the chorus is Eleanor Rigby. And it talks about waits at the window, wearing a face that she keeps in a jar by the door. Who is it for? So it's about loneliness. That was really partially what inspired it because I saw all these people in New York City. It was a city of millions, but a lot of people were very lonely, even in the space of all these people around them. And then a lot of my ideas come from just personally things that I've experienced in life or they're inspired by something that I witnessed. There's one thing that I wrote that came from my time as a debutante in high school. I was a debutante, a reluctant one. And so I wrote about that. So, I mean, it can be anything. Even I even wrote something based on a title. A friend of mine had a title of a song called The Big Empty. And I told him that was an incredible title. And I said, I'm gonna write a script that is inspired by the title. And so I did. I wrote a script called The Big Empty because I love the title and I filled it with, with a story. That's pretty cool. Do you do that a lot with others too? Sometimes, yeah. Title can be very inspiring for me. It's very hard for me to write a script unless I have a title, even if it's a working title. So even if I have an idea for a script, I still have to come up with the title. For some reason, the title, it's almost like a spine to for the story. It's connected somehow to my desire to write. You're also humanitarians based on what I read. So what is a humanitarian exactly? From my perspective, a humanitarian is someone who really believes in serving the greater good in whatever way that you can serve and make the world a better place because that's what you want to do. So in my life, I guess Make a Film Foundation is a huge example of that. But any social situation, social, political situation, if there's a way that I can serve or make things better, then that's what I want to do. I want to serve humanity and make humanity a better place. So does that mean I'm a humanitarian too? I think you are a humanitarian. You are, yes. Absolutely. Oh crap, I'll be adding that to my resume. I think you need to add it to your resume for sure. <laughs> yep, I think you're right. Now, uh -huh. I do want to know this. You had the honor of working with J.K. Simmons and Johnny Depp. So what were they like? really behind the scenes? And what was it like working with them? So J.K. Simmons actually has worked with us twice. He is unbelievably generous and sweet. He always says yes to us and he always shows up above and beyond the call of duty. He's a really sweet man. And he's also extremely professional, right? So we have to have our P's and Q's in order because when he shows up on set, things have to be right so he can do what he's got to do, right? He, he's incredibly talented, obviously. He's won an Oscar. He's fantastic. But he also is just a really good human. I love me some J.K. Simmons. He's a great guy. And then Johnny Depp, same thing. Like, it, it's so surreal to have, like, Johnny Depp show up on your set. We had a feeling that he might be interested in doing this because he has always been visiting hospitals for kids who had cancer and things like that. So we figured like this might be something that would interest him and his people. When we talked to them, they were like, if he's in town, we believe he will do it. And then they were trying to track him down. And at the last minute, they're like, he's in town. He says he'd do it. And, and it's so funny because right up until the moment he showed up on set, none of us really believed that Johnny Depp was going to actually appear. And then he did. And he stayed for hours and hours and he took pictures with anyone who wanted to take a picture. He actually did some improv with Anthony on set. So Anthony got to improvise and work with Johnny Depp in a really cool way. And he was just, honestly, he was the sweetest man. He was so, so sweet. He yeah. sounds like it. I'm glad they're doing it too. 
do you think they learn anything from the experience? I think that everyone who participates in Make a Film Foundation, one of the things that I learned, and I believe other people learn as well, is that you show up thinking that you're going to be giving and contributing, and you are, but what you don't realize is how much you're getting from it and how much you are receiving from the experience. You're like, okay, I'm being altruistic. I'm going to show up and donate my time or donate my services or whatever it is. And then really you are the one who's getting so fulfilled. That's really what it's about. Back to that win-win that we were talking about. Now, folks, we're right back. We're going to hear from Rise Autism Therapy Services. Rise is a new ABA center committed to serving children and teenagers from 2 to 16 in Bloomington and Evansville, Indiana. They value quality of care over anything else. That is why their BCBAs have small caseloads so that your child is a priority. We are dedicated to supporting families and our community to make an impact that is lasting. The small clinic size allows them to be available for you. They want to help make your family's life better and more enjoyable. To book a session, call them at 812-287-8561. Or if you have any questions, please email them at admin at riseautism.com. All right, folks, we're back, and you'll definitely rise to the occasion if you check them out. Now, I do want to know more about Make a Film. So can you tell us some of the programs you offer at Make a Film Foundation? Yeah, so we have two programs, really three, because one is international. But our main two programs are a short narrative program where we invite a child to create a narrative film, and they envision it. We team them with a screenwriter who helps them to create the script. We get a director and then the child stars in it with famous actors and things like that. We get famous directors to direct them. And then we have a documentary program as well, which a lot of times we team with other nonprofits like the uh, a Starlight Children's Foundation or the Muscular Dystrophy Association. And they choose 10 or 15 children. We team them with filmmakers and they create short documentaries or a hybrid of a documentary story. Sometimes kids want to do uh, music videos, but we always have like a documentary component as well as maybe a narrative component or a music video component when we do those documentaries. And sometimes we do one-off documentaries where it's not partnered with an organization, but somebody reaches out to us and they want us to help them create a short film. So we just do it. Can you tell us where can people buy your movies? Because I do see you sell them. So for the short narratives, you can go to our website at makeafilmfoundation.org. And we don't, you know, you can contribute any amount of money, you know, whatever you have that you want to contribute, because it's just a donation to the organization. So it could be five, 10, $20, whatever it is. And then we'll send you a DVD of that particular film that you would like to have. Now, you also said you're the executive director of the CDDP, which stands for Commercial Directors Diversity Program. So can you tell us about that a little bit? So the CDDP is an organization that's sort of under the umbrella of the Directors Guild of of America and the Association of Independent Commercial Producers. And they sort of came together because they wanted us to create a diversity and inclusion program for underrepresented directors who wanted to direct commercials specifically, because there's not a lot of access in the commercial advertising industry. So basically we choose five directors and we team them with mentoring production companies and they get to make commercials. They get to make what they call spec commercials, which are like real commercials, but they don't air on television, but it shows that they know how to create and make commercials so that they can then get work making commercials. I also did a TED Talk. I want to keep that surprise to the listeners. So my question is, how did you get the honor of doing a TED Talk? And what were you hoping the audience would take from your TED Talk? I was really honored to be uh, do the TED Talk. Actually, a friend of mine recommended that I do it. And so I submitted and they loved what I submitted and wanted me to talk about Make a Film Foundation. I always like to share that story. That's really how it came about. A friend sort of recommended me to them and they were like, yes, we'd love you to come in and do this TED Talk. I really just wanted people to understand how you can have setbacks or things that happen in your life and you can turn them. It's like that old saying, turning lemons into lemonade, right? So Just because you have something that happens to you that may seem to be negative on the surface or whatever, it can always inspire you to 
do something bigger or expansive or learn or grow from it in a way where you can contribute something. And it's not just a negative thing, but you can build on that to make it something special. Uh, folks, we'll be right back. We're going to hear from Unlocking the Spectrum. So let's get to it. At Unlocking the Spectrum, we are committed to making the highest quality ABA therapy accessible to all children with autism. We pride ourselves in offering fun, compassionate, and data-driven programs for individuals with autism and unparalleled support for their families. Our personalized approach means that every unique child is given just what they need to reach their maximum potential. We are so happy to support Sam in his mission of taking the stigma off of autism. You can learn more about our services and employment opportunities in both Indiana and Texas at unlockingthespectrum.com or by calling 855-INFO-UTS. That's 855-INFO-UTS. All right, folks, we're back. And yes, you'll definitely unlock the key to success if you check this place out. Now, you also, Ms. Lamson, got to work for the Richmond International Film Festival. What work did you do at the Richmond International Film Festival? So actually, I just, I was a filmmaker. So they showed a feature film that I produced and starred in called Last Life. If you want to see that, you can see it for free streaming on Tubi TV. And they also showed some of our Make a Film Foundation films. So yeah, the Richmond International Film Festival is a great film festival and it's in my hometown. So I love that. Now, I do want to know this. It sounds like you had a lovely family that supported you. So can you tell us a bit about your family and how they have supported you? Yes. So my mom and my dad, as most moms and dads, wanted uh, my brother and I to do something more, I guess, secure. <laughs> because they come from the world of, you need to get a job that's secure. And, you know, but when they realized that my brother and I were very much artists at heart, they really began to support our focus and our careers in that way. My brother is also an artist and a writer and a director, and, and that's what he does. So they ended up with two of us doing that. So <laughs> but my brother has actually volunteered for Make a Film Foundation and helped us make some of the documentary films. He also was the first person to read my very first screenplay and give me notes, which were amazing. So we support each other in everything that we do. We've worked in writer's room together. Sounds like he's a behind the scenes guy. He is now, but he actually used to be an actor. So he was doing theater a lot. Sam, so guess what? There's this, if you go on Amazon Prime, there's a show called Vacations of the Brave. And my brother and I have an episode that we did together where they sent us to Canada on a trip and they wanted to take people who are doing really great things in the world. Like, so they were sort of focused on Make a Film Foundation. And I got to bring someone with me and I chose my brother. So we get to travel around Canada together and it's quite a hoot. So there you go. Yeah, I've been to Canada before. I'm a motivational speaker. So I've gotten to speak in Canada. And I've got oh, to mention wow. real quick, you're actually looking at another TEDx talker. I, I love it. Yes. I did one about <laughs> autism and why people on the spectrum need structure. Oh, yeah. I need structure too, but I get you. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I do so much better when I have structure in my life. It's so Oh, my true. goodness. Same here, buddy. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm a lot more loosey-goosey than I once was, but I still have structure and kind of tedious when it comes to stuff I love. That's kind of my yeah. thought right now. Good change, though. Yeah. Never that with me. Now, folks, we'll be right back. We're going to hear from Great White Smoke. So let's get to it. In the town of Bloomington, Indiana, you can find the best barbecue meat at Great White Smoke. Owned by Dave White, Great White Smoke offers meat catering for events such as weddings and birthday parties. They've won awards such as the 2021 number one food truck in America Grand Champion and the 2019 Kentuckiana Barbecue Pitmasters King of the Q. If you're looking for someone to cook meat for your event, then Dave is your guy. Book them for your next event at 812-229-7571. You can drop them an email on their contact page as well. All right, folks, we're back. And you won't hear smoke on the water, <laughs> but you'll be hearing smoke on the grill. Now, these are just for fun. So so my first question is, what is like your paradise meal or favorite food? And why is it your favorite? Ooh, so, okay. So I'll just say this. Before I became a pescatarian, which is just eat seafood, right? I don't eat red meat or pork, any of that. My favorite food was duck and a sweet sauce. Heavenly. I loved it so much. Ooh, now what is my favorite? I mean, I guess 
since I only eat fish, <laughs> some sort of fish, probably some sort of salmon in some sort of really nice, creamy, delicious sauce. Or, you know, on the flip side, I could just be simple and say French fries, or I never met a potato I didn't like. So any kind of potato. That's cool. I like salmon too. Do you like it with the skin on or off? I know some people have different beliefs on that. I like it if it's cooked with the skin on it, but I won't eat the skin necessarily, right? Okay. I don't, yeah. I just know yeah. some that will go, good skin. Anyway, <laughs> now my next question is, what has been your favorite vacation that you've ever taken? And why did you enjoy that vacation very much? Oh, these are hard questions. Let's see, what is my... So I would say my favorite vacation was going to Ghana in Africa because I got to experience some things that were so moving and it was like the history. It was an unexpected trip. And you didn't see the Black Panther. What a shame. <laughs> I did not, no. <laughs> if only, right? If only, yes. <laughs> My last question is, are there any good memories that you want to tell our viewers about? If you do, why do you remember that memory the most? Now, before you answer... I like to end with a good memory that made you feel good inside. And it can be with the make a film. It can be with just you. And a funny mm -hmm. memory that made you fall on the floor laughing. And that could also be make a film with yourself. Something happened today. Go call how you want to answer it. Wow. Okay. So the easier one, I would say, is the Make a Film Foundation one. And I would say the very first Make a Film Foundation that we did was called Put It in a Book with Jabril Muhammad, who had sickle cell anemia. The reason why that was incredible was because it was like seeing your dream and your vision come to life. At that time, I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't even have a job at the time. I created Make a Film Foundation and I, <laughs> I didn't even know how to, how, I wasn't even get, know how I was going to eat, right? But I was doing this because I was passionately inspired to do so and committed to it. And so seeing it unfold, like the first day on the set, seeing these actors and the director and Jabril and seeing that dream come to life in the space of his dream as well. So it was like my dream and his dream unfolding at the same time. It was beautiful. And I will always hold that dear, dear, dear to my heart. Really incredible. And then let's see a funny one. Wow. There's so many, uh, there's so many comedic moments in my life. I'm going to actually use another Make a Film Foundation one, though. I would just say that when we were on set, Anthony and Johnny Depp were there, and Johnny Depp forgot his lines, started to improvise, and Anthony started to improvise with him as if he was like this actor who'd been doing it forever, and then they just started to improvise together, and the whole set started cracking up and that's actually in our credits right you actually see the improv in their credits and Johnny Depp you know he has kind of a off color sense of humor so some of his jokes are a little edgy <laughs> love him already continue yes exactly and he goes well you know I have a, a kid sense of humor he called it a like a young boy sense of humor whatever he said a teenage boy sense of humor and I was like I guess so you know farts and all kinds of other things yeah but... that's me anything with the bathroom I laugh at like all I, gotta say go. is, all I gotta say is the word fart and here you go I'm laughing on the floor well, he does have a little bit of a bathroom sense of humor going on. So the improv was hilarious because the two of them were going back and forth. So but that was really funny. And I really appreciated that. <laughs> well, T. Lamb, I think that's all. Is there anything you'd like to promote before we head out or any closing remarks? I just want to promote you, Sam, to say thank you. I really appreciated this. I enjoyed it so much. And if anyone wants to get in contact with me about Make a Film Foundation, just go to our website. All of my information is there and we'd love to hear from you. And just thank you. I'm just super grateful. I'm grateful that you have this platform and I'm super proud of you. Thanks for joining me for this episode. Please join for another episode coming in very soon. I hope you enjoyed listening to me ramble. Thank you very much.